Indeed, O oh God, we have come with open hearts. And so let these ancient words impart. Open us new realities, new ways of seeing, that we might also experience new ways of being. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the one who is the living word, and all God's people said, Amen. Congregation, may be seated. We find ourselves just before this, uh, in the season of Epiphany, just before Lent, uh, walking through uh, some of the opening chapters of Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians. This is actually, uh, biblical scholars believe, Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, but it's the only one, or it's the first, that we have preserved for us. And so, uh, Pastor Elizabeth kicked off this sermon series for us last week with a message from 1 Corinthians, first few verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we continue uh, today with these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. In my Bible, this is subtitled, Divisions in the Church. Listen for the word of the Lord. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul. Or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that none of you can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So here's a little clue for you when reading the scriptures. Listen to the women. Always listen to the women. Especially in places where women are routinely pushed down and regularly pushed away, it's important to listen to their voices. This is especially so in sacred scripture, for this book that we love was written in a predominantly patriarchal context, a time and place when women had few rights and marginal respect from their male, male counterparts. So it's important to note that it's a woman, a, a woman named Chloe, who may very well have been the impetus for Paul to pick up his pen and write this letter to Corinth in the first place. It was Chloe who sent her people to Paul to report the schismata, the schisms or the divisions present among the Corinthian Christians. Note that schismata is plural in the Greek, meaning that uh, this isn't just one schism or one division. There are multiple schisms and multiple divisions. I find it remarkable that Chloe, a woman, someone on the margins, someone on the outskirts of civilized society, has actually become a Christian and, given the freedom discovered in Jesus Christ, becomes a leader in the Corinthian church too. I also find it curious that the church at Corinth is so danged good at this schism thing. I mean, this church is not very old. It was only five years old. Five years earlier that Paul had come into this large metropolis of 100,000 people and started preaching and teaching the gospel, the good news that God in Jesus Christ was redeeming and restoring and renewing a world broken and battered and bruised by sin. Because there were no church buildings per se, the Corinthian Christians met in house churches. Scholars approximate that there may have been something like 150 to 200 Christians in Corinth in total. 150 to 200 Christians in Corinth total. 
all of them serving and singing and praying and praising in different houses with different house church leaders. One might think, with all they had received from Paul during his 18-month ministry among them, the folks in Corinth would have had a pretty good handle on majoring in the majors, of keeping the main thing the main thing. But the gospel never comes to us in a culturally pure and undiluted form. And because that's so, sometimes our cultural conditioning distracts us. Rather than majoring in the majors, we begin to major in the minors. Rather than keeping the main thing the main thing, we make a whole lot of little things into the main thing. And this is exactly what happened for the church comprised of several house churches in Corinth. According to Chloe's people, the particular distraction threatening the unity of the church in Corinth was the cult of personality, of misplaced or excessive admiration for a particular person. I belong to Paul, some were saying. Others were saying, I belong to Apollo. Still others, I belong to Cephas. The language is fascinating. In the Greek, it reads quite literally, I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas. On the one hand, give the Corinthian Christians credit. They understood that faith requires surrender, surrendering oneself to submit to another. There's just one problem. They seem to have given themselves up for a bunch of pseudo-saviors, Paul, Apollo, Cephas. And even worse, some are claiming exclusivity to Christ. Go ahead and follow Paul or Apollos or Cephas, they said. At least we follow Christ. At least we're the true Christians. Reminds me of a story among some of my high school friends some of whom went to the other college in Sioux County. They would come and visit me at my particular college, and we would begin making jokes about one another's schools. And I would say, well, at least, at least at Northwestern, our chapel is actually named for Jesus. <laughs> you had to think about that, didn't you? Paul has little time for this cult of personality business evidenced by his string of rhetorical questions. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Here I love the insights from St. John Chrysostom, the great 4th and century preacher. He writes, whenever Paul uses rhetorical questions, as he does here, he implies the whole argument is absurd. Indeed, a church divided along cult of personality lines is absurd. So it sure is a good thing that that was just a Corinthian problem, right? I mean, mean, we don't know anything about that in 21st century North America. Insert tongue-in-cheek here. What is it about Christianity that makes people so susceptible to this? What what makes us substitute pseudo-saviors, pastors and preachers and professors for the actual Savior, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ of God? Prolific New Testament scholar Richard B. Hayes says that the problem for the Corinthian church is that they had given into the tendency to, quote, magnify the messenger and miss the message. Some have come to the faith because of Paul's preaching, And he has become their hero of the faith. Others have been transfixed by the teaching of Apollos, a person known for his wisdom and eloquent tongue. Still others have been buoyed by the stories of Cephas, Peter, the first preacher to speak at Pentecost. At one level, it does make sense. Paul was the founding pastor of the Corinthian church. Apollos possessed gifts of rhetoric and reasoning that few others could boast. Peter's courage and charisma would have been appealing to a fledgling group of people whose numbers make up just 0.2% of Corinth's entire population. And yet, despite the significant impact by all three leaders, note that Paul is unflinching in his determination to set the record straight. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. All of you be in agreement. The word for word translation from the Greek is actually all of you say or speak the same. Paul assumes the Corinthians are speaking Christians, that they are giving voice to their faith, and he wants the the voice that they join together to be sung in harmony. He wishes to remind them of their united whole, one Lord, one faith, one birth, as the great hymn says that we'll sing in just a few moments. 
that there be no divisions among you, no schismata, no schisms, no divisions, no fissures, no fractures, and that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. United, the Greek connotes putting in order of something that had fallen into disarray, in, in the same mind, in the same way of thinking, or in the same attitude, and, and the same purpose is the same intention, or in the same mindset. Essentially, Paul is reminding the Corinthians of their lives before Christ. Remember, your lives were chaotic and in disarray, but God, in the person of Jesus Christ, has put them in order, has set you together. By the power of the Holy Spirit, God has united you with Jesus, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, God has united you with one another. This is the good news of your story. This is the way of thinking or the attitude that should bind you together. And this is the purpose. This is the intent. This is the mindset that serves as your missional mandate. Please note with me, will you, that he calls them not to be united in their positions on issues. Please note with me, will you, that he calls them not to be united on what they believe about this or that. He calls them to be united in the person of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. United in the same mind. And the same purpose makes me wonder, have we lost our purpose as a church? For the Apostle Paul, the same purpose is clear. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but he sent me to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. Paul's purpose is to proclaim the gospel, not with eloquence or rhetorical fanfare, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For Paul... Jesus is at front and center. And through his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus, don't miss this, Jesus is pulling the church together to be united in the same mind and the same purpose. In other words, it isn't about Paul. It isn't about Apollos. It isn't about Peter. It's about Jesus. And when it comes to the focus of the church's life and ministry, the spotlight is solely fixed on Jesus, the one who stands at center stage. I'm struck by the fact that Paul, before rushing headlong into solving all the issues that trouble the Corinthian church, and trust me, they had plenty, reminds them of their purpose, their purpose, their reason for being, their existence. In other words, this isn't just about tolerance or keeping the peace by solving conflict. No, the Christ who has called them into the church through the death and resurrection is the very same Christ who unites them as one body through his death and resurrection. In other words, the message of Jesus Christ is also the means by which the church of Jesus Christ is one. The purpose is to keep the main thing, the main thing. The good news that God, out of God's great love, sent Jesus, who through his life, death, and resurrection, redeems and restores and renews a world marred by sin. As it turns out, this main thing is the main thing and the only main thing that can hold us together. It's apparent, if you read the rest of Paul's letter, there's a whole lot of disagreement in the Corinthian church. Paul does his level best to frame the divergence theologically, but it's clear that Paul's no proponent of homogeneity, and he's no advocate for uniformity. Paul values variety, and he lifts up diversity. Now, Paul's not interested in carbon copy, cookie cutter Christians marching in lockstep order to his apostolic drum. But Paul is interested in unity. He's interested in mind and mindset. He's interested in purpose and intent. And he wishes to remind the Corinthian Christians, and us too, I think, that what holds us together is a purpose so much larger than our differences or disagreements. What holds us together is the gospel, the good news that in Jesus Christ, God is redeeming and restoring and renewing the entire world. As Richard Hayes says it, the church is saved and sustained only in the name of Jesus. I will admit this is hard work for a congregation that belongs to a denomination divided over issues of scriptural interpretation and the social implications of scriptural interpretation when it comes to human sexuality. Two years ago, the General Synod of our denomination, the Reformed Church in America, approved the formation of a 2020 vision team citing what he essentially saw as irreconcilable differences at the time 
Interim Secretary Don Poost asked the General Synod to form this team to explore possible scenarios for our denomination moving forward. The three scenarios were as follows. Staying together, radical reorganization, or grace-filled separation. The team has been hard at work, praying and listening and dialoguing and praying and listening and dialoguing some more, trying to discern the leading of God's Spirit for the RCA. To date, there have been no official proposals, but the team did share an update in late October of last year. I'd like to share that update with you this morning. Listen carefully. The Vision 2020 team met October 28 and 29, 2019 in Grand Rapids, Michigan, continuing the work that God and the General Synod have called us to do. That work is currently focused on discerning the best way forward out of the three scenarios we've been researching, narrowing the options based on intensive dialogue, feedback we've heard, and in faithfulness to God. We're having good conversation, and we've built trust, built relationship, and built friendships. We are doing our work. It's very open. Every one of us has had courage to speak, and that courage enriches our work and pushes us further. We're listening well, and we're honing in on something. We have narrowed down our work and reached consensus on a framework to bring to General Synod 2020. As we have listened to God, to each other, and to the feedback we've received, a possibility is emerging that brings together some of the best elements of the three scenarios. This possibility began to germinate at our September meeting and was refined as we reflected, pinpointed its problems, and identified its strengths. A crucial moment that shifted our understanding was recognizing the difference between general synod statements on human sexuality and the functional reality of our structure. This team believes the denomination has existed for a very long time with functional diversity. Historically, we have been united around our standards. And because of the way our polity works, functionally the RCA is theologically diverse about a range of topics, including human sexuality, infant baptism, and women in church leadership. Our practices vary from classes to classes and congregation to congregation. Our team's role is not to define the RCA's stance on human sexuality or to uh, other differences of conviction, but to recommend a way forward in light of our functional diversity. So we asked ourselves, in a structure with functional diversity, what are our next faithful steps? We are now focusing on recommendations that will increase clarity about the RCA's, RCA's identity as a denomination that embraces its functional diversity and that will provide a pathway for a mutually generous exit for those who can't live within this diversity. We are also exploring recommendations to restructure the denomination to better support a 21st century church. This represents new clarity for the team, and we celebrate this. We understand there is a high level of complexity involved as we move forward. There are these are the broad strokes of a plan that's in its early stages, and much may change as we continue to move forward. We have formed three sub-teams to work on various aspects of this proposal between now and our next meeting in January, and at our next meeting, we'll meet with subject experts to help us craft our recommendations. At this meeting, we also met with the RCA's executive staff to hear about recent developments in ministry and mission, to see where our efforts overlap with theirs and to hear the impact they anticipate from possible recommendations we bring to General Synod. We are energized by hopeful reports of mission around the world, of church planting, and of discipleship, leadership, and mission taking deeper root in the church. These reports make, made us even more mindful of the impact of our recommendations on missionaries, RCA staff, ministers, and retired ministers, churches, and the next generation. Above all, we remember that we are all people of the resurrection. We are God's beloved children, and God has redeemed us and given us hope for the future. We are grateful for the movement of God's Spirit among us. We long for prayer, support, as we continue to move forward with greater clarity. Please join us in praying. Number one, thank God for the unity of our team and for the consensus that we've been able to reach at this meeting. Pray that the Spirit will continue to draw us together as a team until the end of this process. Number two, pray for wisdom to refrain, retain the things that need to be retained, to imagine the implications of the things we've heard, to sort out ideas and values, and to have the wisdom that comes from the Spirit. God can do more than all we ask or imagine, and we are asking and imagining a lot. Three, pray for strength and resolve as we continue to move forward. Pray for resilience and for hope and maintaining perspective. Pray for courage. Four, pray for protection for members of this group as this work makes us particularly vulnerable to forces of darkness. 
5, pray for a season of rest for our team. November and December are busy times in our churches and lives, and yet the work of this team continues between now and our January meeting. 6, pray that as a team and that as leaders and members in RCA churches, we will remember that we are not our own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. I think it's important for you to know this morning that your consistory leaders have been wrestling with the work of the 2020 Vision Team over the course of the past several months. We've taken no action, let me be clear, we've taken no action, nor have we conjectured on what we might do given the possibilities that might arise out of the 2020 General Synod. We've simply spent time listening and learning, seeking to be good stewards of this congregation that we so deeply love by being informed leaders of what's happening at the denominational level. We know there is incredible ideological diversity among us here at American Reformed Church on all sorts of issues including theological diversity when it comes to human sexuality. And we continue to affirm our foundational and fundamental unity that is ours in Jesus Christ. As your pastors, Elizabeth and I must admit, there is some hopefulness in us and that perhaps our denomination will keep the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, at the center of our witness and work in the midst of some significant areas of disagreement. This will not be easy. Some congregations may feel that they simply cannot live in the tension between their own beliefs and what others in the denomination might believe. Some congregations may leave the RCA, others may stay. Either way, all congregations, and do not miss this, all congregations will need to face the messy realities of being the church of Jesus Christ in the midst of a divergent culture that is undergoing seismic changes at a faster pace than the world has ever known before. Through it all, I'm hoping we'll keep our ears open to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, that we'll be united in the same mind and the same purpose. And I'm hoping we'll keep our eyes open too, fixed on Jesus, the one who by his life, death, and resurrection calls us into his church and commissions us for service in his world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Before we come to God in prayer this morning, I have just a few announcements, actually one announcement. Uh, it saddens me deeply to inform you that ARC's former pastor, the Reverend Marlon Vanderwill, passed away yesterday on Saturday, January 25. Visitation will occur next Saturday, February 1 at Hope Church in Holland, Michigan, with services following at 11 a.m. at Hope Church in Holland, Michigan. Please pray for Marlon's spouse, Judy, as well as their four children, Jeffrey, Christopher, Jennifer, and Michael as they grieve. Our prayer this morning comes from the World Council of Churches. Last week was the week of prayer for Christian unity. The sermon arises out of that, and this prayer arises out of that too. Together we pray. Gracious God, heal the painful memories of the past which have wounded our churches and continue to keep us apart. Hear our prayer for reconciliation. Gracious God, teach us to fix our course on Christ, the true light. Hear our prayer for enlightenment. Gracious God, strengthen our confidence in your providence when we feel overwhelmed by the storms of life. Hear our prayer for hope. Gracious God, transform our many separations into harmony and our mistrust into mutual acceptance. Hear our prayer for trust. Gracious God, give us the courage to speak the truth with justice and love. Hear our prayer for strength. Gracious God, dismantle the barriers, visible and invisible, that prevent us from welcoming our sisters and brothers who are in peril or in need. Hear our prayer for hospitality. Gracious God, change our hearts and the hearts of our Christian communities that we may be agents of your healing. Hear our prayer for conversion. Gracious God, open our eyes to see the whole of creation as your gift and our hands to share its fruit in solidarity. Hear our prayer for generosity. One in Jesus Christ, let us pray together in the words that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.